It's, it's, a, um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to in our interactions during this uh, third Southwest Adaptation Forum. And um, it's a privilege to speak with you about some of the climate-related challenges uh, that we're facing in the Southwest. So if the Southwest Adaptation Forum uh, was a three-act play, my role in Act Two is Dr. Gloom. And that's just to remind us about the motivation for doing all of the good work that we do on adapting uh, to climate change and preparing for changes so that we can be um, more resilient uh, in the face of these changes. So these are the only graphs that you'll, you'll see. I'm sparing you. That was a strategic decision to spare you uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of graphs and things. But um, as, so I'll remind you of things you already know. Uh, in the Southwest, we've experienced over the last century, uh, at least, um, an increase in temperature. That's what we see in the graph on the left. Um, on the right, across the southwestern states, precipitation has varied, and we've gone through wet periods and dry periods. The southern part of the region has, has seen a little bit of a trend towards drying. But overall, there hasn't been a really large trend in either direction, region-wide. And so, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure, to scientists to figure out that if temperature is increasing and precipitation is not showing a trend, that there's going to be some effects on the hydrology and uh, ecology of our region. So really broadly, we see declines in snowpack and in the amount of water contained in the snowpack, uh, a decrease in soil moisture, which leads to less water getting into our streams and reservoirs, and putting a, the temperature increase and lack of moisture puts a lot of stress on trees. We've seen a lot of conifer forest mortality across our region. Every state in our region has had its um, fire of record during the last two decades. And for some states, it's been a very recent phenomenon. Fire's always in the headlines in our region. We experience the effects of climate change uh, directly through extreme heat episodes and um, amplified in our cities by Something that has not, very little to do with climate change, but the urban heat island effect. And of course, this also um, is amplified by pre-existing vulnerabilities that typically affect people with lower incomes and people of color, older people, and um, the very young. And also, ironically, because the atmosphere can hold more moisture when it's warmer, this supercharges storms like these atmospheric rivers um, and increases the risk of floods in our region. So that's, that's a really broad overview. But to get um, a more specific look at things, I combed through some uh, news headlines just for the last couple of months. So a new round of uh, Colorado River cuts is announced. And the, the, we're at, on, at the precipice of a, um, of a crisis with this really important river for our region. Um, and uh, in the most immediately, the states of Arizona and Nevada will see further cutbacks in water allocations. California pushed to the limit by a relentless heat wave that broke the mold. So record-breaking uh, heat that almost brought down the energy grid. You can use your imaginations to, ima to figure what would happen if the grid went down and how that would affect um, public health and safety. Heat waves, wildfire, and a hurricane one of the weirdest weather weeks in California weather ever. So we're seeing 
extremes being uh, in our climate and weather amped up by climate change. Those fires that have grabbed the headlines in California for many years, and uh, especially in, in the last five or six years, also generate a lot of smoke, which is another public health risk that also uh, goes, crosses the state line, there's no fence there, uh, into Nevada. Nevada also affected by um, lower uh, water levels um, and finally an acknowledgement that um, mega drought is our new normal. In Utah, the Great Salt Lake has declined uh, substantially, prompting students to um, lead a protest declaring the death of the Great Salt Lake. In New Mexico, a huge summer for um, severe wildfires uh, in the state. And um, adding to that, the monsoon rainfall washed away all sorts of debris and contaminants that affect water supplies in small cities like Las Vegas, New Mexico. Those same effects of fire and post-fire debris and contamination also affect um, native and even non-native fish species as their habitat is wiped away and through the pollution. In Arizona, we have even the conservative uh, Department of Water Resources director saying that uh, the reduction in water supply uh, could slash farming along the river where growers have traditionally enjoyed senior water rights. And you'll see up here that the state is contemplating uh, funding desalination plants in Mexico to provide water to Arizona. Also, a little closer in northern Arizona, this news from Navajo Times about amped up drought affecting aquatic species uh, in lakes on the reservation. And then increased water temperature meeting up with local pollution causes these um, harmful algal blooms along the California coast. Here in the San Francisco Bay, there was a huge fish kill uh, this summer. So that's the gloom report. <laughs> and I will hand it over to Carolyn to give you the sunshine. <laughs> So thank you so much for your attention. It's, it's just a roll. I'm not Dr. Gloom. Thank you, Dr. Gloom. I mean, Dr. Garfa. All right. I'm going to see if I can step down here. Okay. So um, yeah, my role is to kind of turn the page a little bit. Um, it's basically what we just heard from. And Greg, you know, so this is just the synopsis. We've got hotter droughts, storms more intense, all the extremes, bigger floods, post-fire erosion, bigger fire, insect outbreak, forest die off, and all the interactions that has, and all these things to, seem to be coming all at once. And, you know, a lot of times with landscape change, it's gradual, it's slow, but as we've seen here, even in New Mexico, everyone probably has seen this slide from Craig Allen, the Hamas Mountains in the early 2000s. We've seen it go from forest to insect kill to this, now on a regular basis, this large scale forest dieback event. And this is kind of what's become normal to a lot of us, and we've seen this happen before our eyes. So, as Greg sort of touched on too, this has really brought these new realities. This is beyond the scope now of just natural resource management and what you know, the Forest Service is doing, what's the Park Service doing, what's, what's the state doing. Wow, I mean, it's, it's affecting so many sectors now in ways that are so disruptive to our livelihoods, to what we do and how we recreate into our very safety. Um, and, of course, to our cultural heritage. So this has also brought us to the reality that things may not go back to the way maybe we once remember. 
And so our baseline for what is normal and what is real and what should be there is really changing. And you know, this really has now, people are realizing implications for our very mental health. So you know, we've gone from the economic stress to the um, seeing our favorite places change before our eyes so quickly, um, to asthma and those kinds of physical human health effects, loss of species, but also now to our very mental health. So this has left us, a lot of us, in a real conundrum. And unfortunately, a lot of times we speak different languages and really have a difficult time communicating with one another because of a number of things, politics, um, heritage, the state you live in, the county you live in, city versus rural, everything in between. So, this conference, or this forum, this discussion that we're having is about, we got to move this forward. And we have to start talking to one another and start having the conversations. And I think, you know, a lot of this has already started. So it's time to take action. But let's make sure we're on the same page about what we mean by climate action. And so here we have two, and I apologize, that's a little not very bright, so I will read the de definitions. Um, but adaptation and mitigation, you probably have heard both of those words used in a lot of different ways. Um, even if you're a biologist, adaptation means something to you differently than what it might mean to um, someone who is, is working in a completely different field. Um, but adaptation, just kind of in general, and in terms of climate, we usually talk about it this way. It's a variety of actions that are meant to reduce or compensate for or adapt to the adverse impacts that arise from climate changes in the Earth's climate, from changes in the Earth's climate. And then, of course, all of those other things that cascade from there. Mitigation, on the other hand, are actions or changes in societal behavior that are taken to reduce greenhouse gases. And a lot of you may know this already, but again, we're just getting us on the same page. Um, and so this is really trying to reduce greenhouse gases from the atmosphere to prevent significant adverse changes to climate effects. So you need to do them together, actually. We're gonna be talking a lot about today what's on the right-hand side, adaptation. Um, but there are a lot of you that are also working in the mitigation space, and a lot of colleagues or others we know that are working to change city planning, how we move people around, um, how we heat and cool our homes, et cetera. But we're focused on this adaptation side, and we're starting to kind of try to bring the two together and look at the co-benefits between mitiga mitigation and adaptation. And I think there's a lot of knowledge base here that is already working in this space where it really does have an impact on both. So that's what we call kind of adaptation on steroids, if we can get to that space. But certainly in the adaptation, just the doing things that reduce our impact or reduce the impact to the earth species ourselves, and then ultimately to our ways of life. Getting to that middle space sometimes takes a lot more work, but we'll continue to try to, to move there. And the great thing is that there's a lot of places already to do this, where we can start meeting people who are working across fields, across um, landscapes, in all places, working together with common goals. And these are two that have already happened, and maybe you've had the privilege to be part of the Southwest Tribal Climate Change Summit, the National Tribal and Indigenous Climate Conference led by ITEF, as mentioned by um, Anne-Marie yesterday. Um, we also have the upcoming National Adaptation Forum, that's later in the month. 
this forum is actually one of the regional fora that typically would take place pre-COVID in the interim years of the National Adaptation Forum. But we are linked. So you are part of something bigger. And of course, coming up in late November, um, the 2022 National Tribal Leaders Climate Change Summit. This is just a few of the amazing things that are happening out there as people mobilize to take action in a variety of ways, and in particular on adaptation. So by going to these things, we can really start embracing ways to work together. And we draw on these sort of principles, which should all be familiar to you. It's just, again, getting on the same page. The idea that we translate some of the different languages that we speak. And we do this through, from start to finish, no matter what we're doing, collaboration, engagement, commitment, communication, process to create that buy-in, co-ownership and taking in the different decision framing contexts. And in doing so, we're all across the Southwest starting to have these critical key conversations that need to be happening within our communities, within our workplaces, within our families, etc., so that we can all tackle this together. This is not one entity. This is a, everyone doing their part, working together. And so that's what we're trying to do here, is really cultivate that spirit. Let's get going, let's get moving, and um, create those new connections that you don't have. Really take the opportunity, now that we're in person, to build on those relationships that were there, and we can do this.